tea with Marie. And I'm um, having a nice cup of uh, ginger tea that looks like water, but it is ginger tea. And I hope you are home, relaxing at the end of the week, Friday afternoon, take a break and sit down and join our guests. And I'm Marie Yunkin Waldman, your host. And today we have a, uh, a really interesting show because it's something that's on everybody's mind. And um, I first have to explain how we came about getting the guests that we have on our show today. Sitting next to me is uh, Professor Dorothy Reed, or Dorothy as I call her. And next to Dorothy is Dr. Carl Storm. And Dorothy, how did you and I meet initially? Well, it, w uh, it was in a French class right. that in the North Kingstown Library. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we thought it would be so much more fun to just talk French, just to have conversation over a cup of coffee or tea. A tea and right, so and tea. We, we got together <laughs> with uh, a few other people in the class and mm -hmm. set up just getting together. Um, to to have a French conversation group, and then we we found it was a really interesting group of people, uh, and uh, started talking about our different interests. You were sitting right next to me. I was I sitting right that. next to you in the class. And yes. the French class was almost like going back into high school. And they said, "Well, we'll see you next month." Yeah. And we thought next month. That's too long. And then you were reading my mind because you said, "Hey, how about would a bunch of us get together and do this in conversation yeah. for, yeah. you know, six people or something?" Right. And then since then, that was a few months ago. We've had several meetings. We've gone swimming. We've spoken French on the beach. We've, we've cooked, cooked in French. We've cooked in French. <laughs> we made yes. crepes the other night. We've had a great time. Yeah. And we found out that we were all um, very interesting people, and that we our partners were interesting people too. Yeah. And then that's where we. You and I engaged in a conversation about the science, and um, we discovered we were each reading a book by the same author. Different Richard books. Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, yeah. who is a scientist who writes about science for non-scientists, but in a very interesting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I was reading that book that I can't remember the name of, and something about humanities and sciences with a bunch of essays from various scientists that are alive today, mm. and they're writing about some of the humanistic aspects of it and so forth, and. If <laughs> anyway, then we talked about global warming, mm -hmm. and yes. I've been wanting to do a show on global warming. Right. And that's when you um, talked about Carl, your partner, and next thing you know, here's Carl, and here we're doing a show on global warming, which is not really a funny subject. But anyway, that's how we met. Now, there's a movie out there by that Al Gore is in that some of you may have seen called An Inconvenient Truth. And I have the book. And just to open the show, I just want to read just a short um, couple of words, and then we're going mm. to speak to you two and find out about what the real truths are about this whole thing. But this is at the introduction, and um, talk, Al Gore has written this book, and he talks about how the climate crisis is indeed extremely dangerous, that we're melting the north polar ice cap and virtually all of the mountain glaciers in the world. We're destabilizing the massive mound of ice on Greenland. And we have a picture to show you of that in a little bit. And the equally enormous mass of ice propped up on top of islands in West Antarctica, threatening a worldwide increase in sea levels of as much as 20 feet. Right. And that's what and happens. If you live when in the Narragansett, melts, right? you might want to think where 20 feet will take you. And, then, and that could yeah. be devastating yes. to all kinds of places. And um, different things are happening. We're dumping so much carbon dioxide into the Earth's environment that we have literally changed the relationship between the Earth and the Sun. And uh, last year, he said that the National Academies of Science in 11 most influential nations came together to um, call on every nation to acknowledge that the threat of climate change is clear and increasing and that the scientific understanding of climate changes is now sufficiently clear to justify nations taking prompt action. So let's talk about that. First of all, Carl, can Maybe some people out there who, believe it or not, don't know what global warming is and what it means. Let's start with definitions. Well, the uh, average temperature of the Earth <coughs> has been around 15 degrees centigrade for many, many years. 
And uh, that's this, a little below 60 degrees Fahrenheit for okay, those of us who you. function in Fahrenheit. Right. And uh, this particular graph shows the average temperature of the Earth between about 1880 and the current time. And you can see on the <laughs> older edge of the graph, all of the blue lines indicate that the temperature of the Earth was a little bit below the average. And kicking over in about 1940, the graph turns red and the uh, average temperature is kicking up a little bit. Now, the period between, I'll oh, say, about 1880 and present is not very long no. in terms of the history of the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. So people uh, raise the question as to whether global warming is real or is this just some very short-term uh, effect that they are seeing. Now, just a quick question. I, I'm always interested in how you they gather information back in 1880 and, and, and how they were able to get this information at, going back about almost, you know, over 100 years. Well, they use uh, every trick that they can think of, and in some cases it's a result of a direct measurement, and in some cases it's secondary information. It's inferred from other things that they can see. Uh, for instance, uh, the atmospheric scientists are always delighted to find, say, an old brass military button that's tightly sealed, and there's good reason to believe that the atmosphere that is in there was captured at the time that the button was made, and if it's associated with a uniform that they can accurately date, then they can drill back into that button, take that sample of air, and can look at the carbon dioxide concentration hmm. that's in it then and any other gases such as... So if people have old military buttons, <laughs> they should save them and send them to the scientists, They right? could be very, very valuable. <laughs> uh, they can look at tree rings and you can count them and you can learn the uh, age of the tree, but you can also infer things about how much the tree grow, grew during that particular year and that in turn can be related to temperature and things like carbon dioxide level. Uh, the most widely used and I believe the most accurate thing is they will go to the Antarctica, they will go up to Greenland and they will drill ice cores and bring them up, keep them cold and then just like tree rings you can count each year in the ice core you can see the snow that fell you can see it compressed with the weight of the snow <coughs> weight of the snow and you can see little bubbles in this ice hmm. and you can very carefully go into that bubble and again measure the actual carbon dioxide concentration that was in the snow that fell uh, in that particular year then there's an additional trick, which is much more sophisticated, is that every element um, exists in more than one form, and they're called isotopes. And the ratio of these different isotopes, like carbon-12 to carbon-13, oxygen-16 to oxygen-17 to oxygen-18, gives you the temperature that it was when that CO2 was trapped in that bubble. And okay, so is that radioactive? Uh, no, these, no are, these, these are stable isotopes. Okay, they, they, mm -hmm. they're stable in the sense that they, that they, la they don't change, they don't decay. If they were radioactive, they would break down. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. they, but there are isotopes that are different, that's the number is their weight, but they, uh, but they don't change, so they can be 400,000 years old and they're still just sitting there. Mm -hmm. And using all of these tricks, uh, they're able to go back and look at 400,000 years of history hmm. and measure the temperature and the carbon dioxide level and correlate the two of them together. And this graphic shows that there's a pretty good similarity of the uh, relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide. Yeah, the red line is the, is the carbon dioxide concentration in the air and the years are going across from 400,000 years ago till now, and then the blue line is, is the temperature measured by an, an independent, measured independently of the carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. and then they plot them and compare them. Who made those graphs? Um, <coughs> there are a number of different scientists that are interested in it. Um, 
Uh, there are major atmospheric research uh, centers at MIT, uh, out at the Scripps Institute on the West Coast, and uh, virtually every country uh, in the world has a major research interest in uh, atmospheric uh, sciences. And one of the really important points that Al Gore makes in his presentation is that there's a very good consensus among all of these people mm -hmm. as to what uh, is taking place. Mm -hmm. And the data, for instance, that is in this graph, uh, I think is, is... Why don't we hear more about that in the general media? The, the, you know, about all the, the consensus and, and the scientists and how much they're working on it, working together in the different countries. I mean, I don't read that much in the media. I'm reading it in the Al Gore book, but I'm wondering why we don't hear more about this. Well, in today's Providence Journal, there was a fairly yeah. lengthy article uh, on permafrost in Russia and how it appears to be melting and it is going to lead to a huge outgassing of methane and carbon dioxide. It's going to mm -hmm. dwarf the yeah. things. Uh, three days ago, there was an article in yeah, the Conference I that Journal. Out. I thought I put that in the on, book here. On um, the melting of the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. And if that goes away, uh, pretty much the water supply for California. But there was something in Vermont recently, too. They had some type of demonstration up in Brattleboro or someplace like that. Yeah. Or Burlington, maybe it was. Yeah. Uh, having to do with global warming yeah. and it recently. There, but, I mean, there are things that are out there in both in popular magazines and in the newspaper and in somewhat more more scientific ones but the question is who you know how many people are actually reading them and mm -hmm. remembering them mm -hmm. there was an article about how birds migrating back from Africa to Europe are finding that their 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 hatching time their, they lay eggs and the eggs hatch but their hatching times are no longer correlated with the times when the caterpillars are hatching so that they're they're no missing some of their the times when the what is hatching the, the caterpillars. Oh, the ca so the birds need to, to feed the caterpillars to the baby birds. But if the baby birds hatch uh, after the caterpillars, oh. then they don't have any. It's all some kind of synergistic right, relationship right. in so, nature. So as it's getting warmer, the caterpillars are hatching earlier, but the birds aren't getting back there as when the caterpillars oh. are hatching. So, so they're getting really out of sync. Messing, I was going to use another word yeah, now, yeah. on TV, messing up nature it's, with yeah, all the different everything is, balances has that nature. adjusted itself over time, but evolution is very slow, mm -hmm. and these changes are too fast. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the animals and the plants are having trouble keeping up with this rate of change. If it gets too hot for pine trees to grow, the pine trees can't pick up their roots and walk north. Very good point, and because we look, we have to look at this in terms of the time span, and 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 when you're mm -hmm. seeing how, how long is the how old is the Earth or how old are five billion years, five, four, four, four yeah. point eight billion. So we're looking at that, yeah. and then we're looking at these changes taking place within our lifetimes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's that's a very good point, and in, in that what is illustrated on this graph are natural cycles, and they could come from huge volcanic eruptions. They could come from the impact. Of a, of a large uh, meteorite with the Earth and different things. In some cases, uh, natural change and evolution can keep up with them. Mm -hmm. And other times, all the dinosaurs just disappeared. Right. Now, what we're seeing now is a forcing of the uh, Earth's climate change by man's activity. And this is the first time in the history of man, which is about two million years, About depending million on what, years. what you call yeah. people. You know, how, where where you want to yeah. draw the line between yeah. people and 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 hominids, the you know our our, our, our ape-like ancestors. Mm -hmm. so this is the yeah. first time we've had the ability to really force the uh, climate and the earth and huge changes yeah. in the environment on the earth to uh, to change as a result of our activity. Well, I think mm -hmm. that's. A, a question that everybody yeah. asks. Is it really a result of the human activity or um, is it just some of the things that are happening?